sit there, bask in the euphoria. Hi, everyone. I'm Jen Pogue. I am the Canadian Film Fest Industry Series producer. Welcome to our final panel for our, uh, Canadian Film Fest Virtual Edition 2020. Um, before we get into it, I would like to uh, reiterate a statement we put out a couple days ago. Canadian Film Fest stands in solidarity with our BIPOC friends and colleagues and our commitment to anti-racism. We promise to continue to do our part to ensure we lift up BIPOC voices, both within our organization and in the stories that we spotlight. We believe that Canada has more than one voice and we wanna to continue to offer our platform to share with all Canadian content creators in an effort to tell your stories. We hope ultimately that the information the CFF provides in our industry series helps not only the Canadian filmmaker, but the BIPOC filmmaker, their projects, and those that continue to seek the tools to succeed in our industry. It is in the spirit that we are continuing this dialogue, as well as taking time to learn and reflect on our own actions within our organization and beyond. We are here today to learn about the importance of efficiently preparing for your post-production. It's a vital role in getting our stories to the big or little screen, and often it's overlooked in prep. So this is so important that we talk about this today. Thank you so much to our incredible panelists who are here to share their expertise. Our industry series would not be possible without our incredible sponsors. So big thanks to Super Channel, the Distillery Restaurants, Retake Furniture Rental, Ontario Creates, and um, an extra special thanks today to today's main sponsors, uh, Red Lab and Pivotal Post. Yeah. We will be taking audience questions throughout this conversation. So please feel free to write your questions in the comment sections on our Facebook and YouTube streams. Uh, our team will be fielding them and sending them over to our moderator, Lauren. Um, I'm so pleased to introduce Lauren. Lauren Grant of Clique Pictures is a multi-award winning producer. Some of her many credits include Riot Girls, Wet Bum, Picture Day, uh, oh, and your documentary on the line just took home two Canadian Screen Awards last week, Lauren. Is that right? Did yeah for editing. Yeah, that's editing, amazing. Editing, editing and directing. <laughs> that's incredible. Yeah, congratulations. Um, so, without further ado, I will let you take the floor and please introduce us to our awesome panelists. Yes, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for sharing your mission statement. I think it's really important. Um, we have so many great people to talk about post-production. I think it's sometimes the forgotten, under-budgeted thing that is so, so important. I've definitely done my share post-supervising when I first started in this business. I think it's very important to sort of get the full scope of all that's possible so that you can make your movie, you can sell it places, you can screen at film festivals, and you actually have the things that everyone needs. So I'm going to just introduce everyone by name, and then I'm going to get everybody to have, let the, start this off with something super positive about what was one of your aha moments, something that just clicked for you on a project, career-wise, one thing, one positive thing that sort of changed your outlook. So our panel is composed of Kat Weber, an amazing editor, director herself. She is the editor of Hazy Little Thing, which is also screened at the festival. We have Jane Tattersall, an amazing, amazing, amazing sound designer, sound editor. She is uh, such an invaluable resource. I'm very excited that you're here. We have Justin McConnell from the Project Unstable Ground and director, your name is, your date name is cut off in your intro. So you're- I, gonna... I'm from Unstable Ground and my project is Clapboard. <laughs> it's Clapboard dot, dot, dot for me. <laughs> yeah, it's not, Justin is just not unstable. He yeah, is exactly. unstable. I, I'm, yes, Justin's gonna talk about his project, his festival, as well as the whole filmmaking and post-production process. We have Brendan Carmody, who will also be from Pivotal Post. And we have Janelle Bechthold, who is an amazing composer, and we'll also talk about that, as well as Warren Sonoda, director, post-supervisor, editor. Uh, I'm not sure what you can't do, Warren. <laughs> so if that's your aha moment that you realize there's something you don't know, I think we'd all feel a little better if we knew <laughs> <laughs> your secret one thing you can't do. Um, but let's start with Kat, something that, you know, an aha moment for you, career-wise, project-wise, something that kind of clicked. Yeah, I think, um... In general, the aha moments can be divided into kind of like creative, technical, and business for me. 
um, and overall, um, the one arcing thing is collaboration. Um, that has been just the key to everything in my career from my work as a director to my work as an editor is just, and also coming up, um, having gone to acting school, it's always been me creating things with my friends and um, just that joy of creation and finding people that have um, similar interests and tastes is just so crazy to think that those friendships start that started led me to where I am now. And uh, yeah, so I think finding your people and always being a, a collaborator is my, my aha moment. Cool. Justin, something from you? Uh, <laughs> mine isn't really the opposite of hers. Collaboration is really important, but uh, I came up in the early 2000s um, at a bunch of post facilities. And uh, I got into post as a way to get into making my own films because uh, I figured with the way the tech was going and the, the, how much more affordable it was becoming for everything, the more I knew as a jack of all trades, the better I could pull off productions at a low budget because I had no money and I was self-financing almost everything I made from music videos. Well, music videos were clients, so they paid, but uh, you know, short films, my first few features, uh, pretty much everything up to Life Changer has either come out of my pocket or the tiniest of investments from friends or family. Uh, and in order to pull that off, I've kind of had to get really, really good at meeting QC, like meeting QC requirements and delivering masters. And, um, and that's built my company on stable ground up uh, to the point where I now do service uh, Blu-ray and DVD authoring, trailer editing, captioning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, for a bunch of clients. So that keeps me alive while I make these indie films. So for me, the aha moment was kind of going, okay, I need to learn to do as much of this as I can myself because uh, I can't afford to go to these bigger facilities uh, in, in these early days. Um, and that sort of built into where I am now. And I think self, self efficiency uh, is the, was the big aha moment. And then collaboration gradually came more and more and more and more as my career built. Yeah, no, I think that's really going to be really valuable insight. I think we all, I think there's something interesting with changing technology over the last, you know, 15 years that has really allowed people to make their own projects. All along. Look, look at this panel. It's because of technology. Yeah, I know the technology, but also, and then also the idea that, you know, you can make your film, but you do still have to figure out about that audience and post-production being so vital to like make the leap of how can people actually screen this. Um, so yeah, how about you, Brendan? I'm going to... You're a aha uh -huh moment. Um, I mean, growing up in the industry, I've kind of had a, a lot of them because I get to see kind of so many different gears of how the machine works. Um, I guess the one kind, two kind of overlapping things that for me are just constantly, you know, hammered down is prep. It's so invaluable. I mean, one extra week of prep before you shoot can can make things so much easier uh, versus trying to squeeze that week of prep into when you're already going. Um, and, and the same thing goes for post, uh, you know, making sure you've got a good post supervisor that understands, you know, this is the goal of the look of the picture and this is the what is required from us from our distributors and, you know, whoever we sold the project to because I've seen this time and time again where people come in and not familiar with the whole process and, they, you know, something comes up and it's like, oh crap, I didn't know I had to do that. And now these costs and stuff come out of nowhere and your producers start to have heart attacks. And um, so that's a huge thing. Um, the second one would be communication. Um, I say it all the time, it should flow like water. If there's something in the way, it should find a way around it. It should keep happening. If there's a problem, talk about it. Don't mm -hmm. wait till the last minute because it will be too expensive to fix. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's that's a huge one that I see a lot. Um, there are some people out there that are phenomenal to work with that it's just like the, that communication line is always open. I know what's going on. I know what their requirements are. Um, and that's great. And then I guess one of the bigger kind of aha moments for me kind of on the post side would be setting up for Pompeii. Um, that was the first time I had to do uh, a multi-editor editorial system that was all based in 3D and we had to have the systems run remotely and we had a screening room down at the end of the hall that needed to connect to the different editors. And this is back when 3D was still, you know, fairly infantile in, in terms of, you know, the avid support and things like that. So it was, I mean, I remember walking in going, 
how are we going to do this? Um, and, but we made it work. And it was kind of like, all right, cool. If you've got the right team of people, then you can really kind of put your heads together. You get like a little think tank going and it's like, all right, this is what we need to do. How do we get there? And, you know, people will chime in with stuff like, oh, I would have never thought to try that or I've never known that existed as an option. Um, so that's kind of cool. So, yeah, prep, communication, teamwork, uh, that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's most certainly the most collaborative, you know, it is the film business for the business side, but it's also so collaborative. We're not, we can't, we can't do this all alone, although maybe Justin or others can talk about that. Maybe you can, but I think eventually you want to interact with other people. Um, so Jane, do you want to talk about yours? I'm sure you have had uh, such a range of experiences of budget size and projects and, and uh, I would love to hear something that clicked for you that changed sort of how your process works potentially. Well, thank you. Um, I have, I've, of course, as we all have many, many, many aha moments, but uh, I think the one that I found the most kind of affecting change is is um, I, because I have a, my career started as an apprentice, apprentice as a sound editor. I was fortunate to work with some incredibly talented people. So I learned well and I did lots of good work and I got some good projects and I, you know, got some recognition for that. But it wasn't until I ran into and started working with Clement Burgo and he asked me something where he we started to talk about the sound and I was you know sort of taking notes from him going scene by scene and what does he want here and what does he want there and he kind of said well like I want you to do what you want to do and and that was uh, like a bit of a shock because I didn't know that that was part of what I could do I didn't know that would ever be wanted I didn't know that was part of my job it was kind of terrifying because I had to think about what was my opinion what if I had a blank canvas what would I do not that it's blank but you know what I mean yeah and um so that was like it's a creative thing it's like oh I can contribute something creatively now the director and filmmaker may not like what I do but I'm allowed to offer it and you know it's, that's a very uh, kind of empowering and fun and terrifying thing to do, have learned I love yeah that. For sure. And what about in Janelle, for you? Is there something potentially similar? It's like, I think how you, you're coming, I think often composers are hired near the end. <laughs> maybe they should not be, maybe you should be involved earlier, but what's, what's an aha moment for you in the process? Well, I I think definitely in terms of my creative process, the real aha moment came um, when I realized that composers are, are probably more filmmakers and more storytellers than musicians, which is might seem a little weird. Um, but I mean, they always talk about in the filmmaking process, there's, there's the, uh, the story that you write, the story that you shoot, there's the story that you edit. But then music really helps to craft that story and help to tell, um, I, I guess, and guide the audience through the story. And so, um, I mean, everything, everything I do comes from that place, that place of being a storyteller. And even um, on every project, I, I usually try and find a thing, whether it's like a musical motif or an instrument or a unique sound, something that's gonna be unique and personal to that story that really helps to tell it. Um, so that's definitely um, probably like my biggest creative aha moment, um, but, other, um, outside of that, um, I think for uh, one of the moments that really helped to propel my, my, uh, my career forward um, was just finding someone to champion me who, um, who recognized my work, worked with me, and then kept recommending me. That was so impactful and so powerful. Um, and it's, uh, I think, I think there's there has to there's something to be said about showing up and doing really great work, and being and being um, just like Kat said, being a good collaborator, somebody who who listens well and communicates well, and um, and comes to the table with their their ideas and and uh, really from a place of story. For sure, yeah. And Warren, what about for you? I feel like oh. I you know, I, thank you very much. And, and Lauren, thank you for moderating today. I think 
uh, in terms of moments, we're all having a moment, especially this week. It's been, uh, it's been painful, it's been grueling. I think moments like this um, help some people to see what's going on. And for me, if you're asking about an, a filmmaking aha moment, it's kind of tied in with the moment that we're all going through right now um, with um, Black Lives Matter and um, you know just the, the, the systemic nature of racism itself is confronting my own biases and my own gaps and blind spots. Uh, the ha aha moment for me came when I realized uh, I was going into my 11th feature film that I was going to direct and uh, fortunately I was able to write it and I'd never cast a Japanese Canadian in a role before and that's on me that's my own personal gap uh, and 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 um, in reaction to that uh, uh, we created things I do for money which is about two Japanese cello playing brothers from Hamilton that steal a bag of money and we didn't make it as a declaration or anything I wanted to make a, a cool crime caper but um, uh, to claim that space, which is otherwise, you know, the crime film space, uh, and to claim it a little bit uh, with a personal story, I, I, I echo what uh, Janelle and Kat's been saying in terms of like, um, and, and Jane, you just said it, it's when, when Clement, who's amazing, uh, the DGC is doing a masterclass very shortly with Clement, and I advise everybody to check it out, it's, it's, it's on Zoom. Um, when Clement empowered you to say, hey, your voice matters in this, uh, that was my aha moment where it's, it's um, your perspective, your personal prism of how you see the world is, uh, is far more important than, you know, can you get your day on time? Do you know what the lenses are? All that you can learn, but you, you, you have to take uh, responsibility for the, the voice that you have. And I think, Janelle, that's what you were talking about in terms of being able to empower other people and getting that recommendation is is um, is having something very distinct to say. So that's kind of my aha moment. I don't know if it's specific to the post process, but certainly in filmmaking in general, uh, it's been something for me. And I and and I think the world at large right now is having a huge moment like that of realization. Uh, yeah, it is, and I hope I I hope it's. I hope it's an aha moment we can carry forward when, you know, the news cycle changes that yeah. we can really, especially I think we're, we have a privilege of, we make, we make movies and films and videos and we tell stories and how do we help support stories that maybe aren't our perspective. Um, I think that's something interesting because I would love to talk about the collaboration with directors and producers. I think one of, you know, you think about um, Martin Scorsese, you know, he's worked with with Thelma Schumacher forever. And so there is an interesting thing of you find your people, you find your collaborators and you move up in your business together. And I think this moment hopefully will help us question of how do we then, if we're doing that, are we just moving up with the people who look the same and think the same as us? So um, yeah, I thank you, Warren. I think it's really, it's really important to be constantly, I think, questioning ourselves and the stories we're telling and what we're putting in the world. and you know, all the different parts of the, the post process, the filmmaking process that we all participate in. And it's, it's cool to meet new people. It's great. It's, it helps, it helps everybody. It's, it's, uh, it's awesome. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, for, for sure. And yes, many thoughts about that. Yeah. Um, but why don't we talk a little bit about that, that process for everybody. Um, and then I do want to also in this uh, hour and a half talk about how do we get more people into post-production, into filmmaking, post-production for sure is a very uh, white side of the business, including in a business that is all very quite white. So how do we embrace people? How do we get them in? How do we support them? How do we champion people coming in? Um, and let's, we'll get to that next, but let's first start with that working. If anyone would like to talk about that collaboration, you all sort of touched on it in your answer to your aha moment, because we are not working alone. Uh, in rooms by ourselves, despite currently us all being in rooms by ourselves. Um, but yeah, what is that? What is what do you look for in that working relationship with the director, producer, um, writer? What is you know, if it's television, the showrunner? What is what is those skills that you really value when you meet with people and decide you're taking on a project? I'll jump in first, uh, just yeah. because Kat is uh, on my Zoom, is right beside me. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I, I, I loved uh, uh, the work that she was doing. Um, and uh, we, I think we immediately 
kind of really clicked in terms of uh, what we were trying to do. I was doing a, a CBC of the week at the time um, uh, for hatching, matching, dispatching. It was hilarious and it was fun. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, you, you do, there's a, uh, Janelle, you're talking about being recommended. You do have to be careful what you wish for because um, uh, Kat's so busy now that I can't even get her on my projects. And that's a testament to your amazing talent, Kat. Uh, but you also, you know, you, you empowered uh, Anna Catley to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to edit my film, uh, Things I Do For Money. And it's all that sort of um, uh, help and, and, and support and encouragement that, uh, that I love about the collaboration process. I mean, what Janelle was saying about um, someone champion championing you, you uh, have always been such a champion of me. And I think that's one of the reasons that I am quite busy. So thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think what I look for in collaborators has a lot to do with what you were saying, Brendan, about communication. Um, and an ease of communication yeah. and uh, kind of it all goes down to also Janelle what you were saying about story when you have a shared purpose um, of telling this story I think that it allows for kind of the niceties and, and the like polite behaviors to kind of not have to be there anymore in the small talk and just go right into the story. And um, I guess one thing I look for creators that can separate um, like those things from the work. And sometimes I'll disagree with a director and having that voice, like you're saying about Jane, about being able to stand up for yourself, I think, or not stand up for yourself, but have your own um, voice and be able to communicate exactly what your taste is or what your vision is in your own art form. Um, I look for people that can do that and who are able to have that discourse back and forth and encourage um, not just agreeing with everything and every idea, you know? I, yeah, directors want to be surprised. We yeah. want you to, to show us something that we don't know about. And like to, we're all fighting towards the same purpose. So I think that tension, when it has an ease of communication, if that tension is there, then there's that excitement and creation. If it's kind of just like nobody cares and we're just doing it, there's a little bit of tension that I like in the creative process. Yeah. I'll go a step further and say I prefer people to call me on my shit all the time. <laughs> like, Whatever, you sure do, man. and vice versa, and vice versa, and in pretty much every level, post or if something I'm directing or something I'm producing, it's always good to have a conscientious voice who is in the same exact team as you and wants the same thing, but may it come from a from a different angle, and you and it makes something better, I think, in the long run. And that's actually something I had to learn as I was more collaborative with my later projects. I mean, it's not like nobody worked on the other projects, but. Um, I had to open myself up to the idea that uh, all these outside voices, and now I test everything. I get like 30 or 40 opinions on everything I do or more, any movie I make, anything I do, um, if, within reason, uh, just so that I can find the truth in all the conflict, because nobody has the same answers ever. So you just find the truth in all the conflict. Because mm -hmm. the truth is somewhere in the middle. That's, yeah. I think that's always what you find. Uh, Justin, what you said kind of reminds me of what my my teachers told me in film school was it was you know when you're doing your project, don't go and show it to your mom and say hey what do you think? Go to somebody that's actually going to be critical and be honest and understands what you're trying to do because otherwise you're just oh okay then it must be good and you know you're selling yourself short. Yeah, you don't want yes men or yes women or yes you know yes anything people. else. You yes people. people. Yeah, you just you don't. You want uh, you want people who believe in the good of what you're trying to do but at the same time, know that you can be better and we'll tell you that. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Well, and I think I, I personally always look like, as a producer, look for that in an editor and, and composer and all creative collaborators is you're, you're, it is a collaborative business and you're also bringing your creative sense. And I want, I bet I once was hiring on a project and I had this conversation with the director and they're like, oh, I think this editor is a good fit because we like all the same movies. And I was like, actually, I think that's the exact reason why they're the wrong fit. I think actually you, you understand the core of what the movie we're making, but they're actually going to challenge your perspective and I think make the film better. And I, I really, I have two films in post in this 
state of the world and got to work with Christine Armstrong and I'm working with Maureen Grant. Mm. And it's like, I love when they say, when you give a note and we can try it. It's not about not trying ideas and all ideas can be tried, but they're like, actually, this is what I think would work better. And here, what about this? And I've been thinking about this. And those are just such a great collaborators. And, and Jane on, and Janelle on the sound and music side, I've had, you know, um, Peter Chapman did Riot Girls, who just nominated for original song for his original 80s jock jam. It brings me so much joy. And for his score, uh, he lost to Howard Shore, as we kind of expected to happen. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think, and he also did he also did the documentary, and he really, you know, I think working with composers and and your sound team who can really help to elevate and, and are still coming back to here's the core of the movie, but this is how you can bring your creative talent to elevate what we've already done. And I, I love, I love posts. I trained to be an editor at university and then weirdly if you edited, you had to, uh, to produce. And so I kind of got into, I fell into producing in that way. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, anything to now Jane from your perspective of that collaboration and, and things that make it great. Well, certainly, um, I think Janelle will probably feel the same way, but we'll see what she says. Is it's a feeling like um, you're on, you're in this, you're, you're, you're making the same film because uh, sometimes, you know, you, you have someone who's, who just has a different idea of what, what, what it is. And so you have to have this, you have to share the, it's not, it's not temperament or anything. It's just share, just, it, just, just moving in the same direction. And mm -hmm. so that, because um, if you're if you're not, and then you're bringing up ideas, you just know they're going to get shot down, and then you're not as collaborative, and you're not as open, and then it's just like you can do a decent job, but it's it's never going to be as good as it might have been. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would I would agree with that as well. I would also say that I'm I'm looking for somebody who's brave, mm -hmm. and and I say that because music. I mean, it can be really fun, but it can also be really scary for a lot of people because it's hard to talk about something that, like, if you know nothing about it. Um, I, I think I think coming coming to to the table and being able to communicate um, and speak the same language is kind of key. And so, um, for a lot of filmmakers, I really prefer when people talk in more emotional language. Mm -hmm. um, for sure, just to get their ideas across rather than musical language. Um, the number of times I've sat there and said, yeah, okay, so you don't like the trumpet. Uh, there's no trumpet in this, um, <laughs> you know, but you know, it's, 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 it's a process and I want somebody who's brave and willing to work through the process with me, which might, might be like, yes, this isn't right, right now, but let's figure out what can be changed, what, what can be shifted. And somebody who um, can see the vision because not every part of the music making process is going to sound beautiful right away because part of that's working with musicians and we're doing recordings and things after we get the initial structure down. Um, so I, th I think that's, that's definitely something I, I, I look for in a, in a collaborator. Yeah. Warren, do you have anything to add? in your perspective from your coming no, up? No, I, I just, I, I just want to um, echo what Kat initially said, um, you know, uh, and, and Justin, you know, it's like, I think as a, as a filmmaker that has a post background, I have utmost respect for editors because uh, I used to edit all my stuff. And um, not only can I not do that anymore, um, I, I, I want that added layer of uh, um, perspective. Mm -hmm. and uh and and it just again so i want to be surprised when when cat gives me a cut she surprises me with what she can get out of my footage and that's the true testament of when you're working with an editor and and really um getting to the good stuff of the of the material because uh you know i've lived with this material for like a year and now she's surprising me with it uh that's that's a that's pretty cool and it makes the whole process fun um at the same time um you know, uh, there's there's moments where it's like I have a pretty pretty particular thing that I want to do, uh, and uh, I think the filmmakers out there um, that that uh, you also have to um, stick to your stick to your vision when you have something, uh, and you're not quite getting it out of the edit. Uh, you just have to be clear, and and what everyone's saying is communication. Communication is key. If you can't if you can't actually speak in terms that an actor can 
readily give you a performance that uh, you're looking for. You can't do that with an editor either. You have to be able to talk in a language that they can understand why you want a slip audio edit because I'd rather have the audio come in under the video because it just, for me, it, it's a more elegant cut. Uh, you, you need to kind of, the directors have to educate themselves. I'm sure uh, uh, Justin can attest to that where you know, you're, you're, you're doing all sorts of post DCP and it's very technical and like you've done my DCPs, I don't know anything about it. And all your so, deliverables. And all my deliverables. Yeah, I and, think I did do them all, yeah. <laughs> and you know, as a director, you have to learn that. So there's a responsibility on us to be able to communicate properly. For sure, I think it's also, it's like, it's one of those challenges I've, I've mostly produced for features. And there is that thing where you're getting, there's that balance between collaboration I find with directors and all their key creatives on set, but also in post where you want everyone to be bringing their ideas, but you also have to really hold uh, the, what the, the core of your movie is so that you can say when, you know, you as the director, your idea, you're gonna say no to someone else's suggestion that. Uh, and then also be aware when someone else's idea elevates what that core is. I think you kind of have to always come back to what is, what is the movie and, and what is the story you're telling. Um, a, oh, sorry. No, go um, ahead. There's a great quote, and I don't know who it's attributed to, but it's, if a thousand people tell you you're dead, lay down, which mm -hmm. is a really great way of basically saying that if you farm out for outside opinion and enough people say the same opinion, there might be something there to listen to. That's, yeah. 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 Or I find in posts, especially, I don't know, Kat, how you feel about this, is like, you might get 10 ideas of how to fix a problem. Mm -hmm. And maybe those ideas don't work, but they're all talking about the same part of your edit. So clearly there is a problem there. Mm -hmm. Even though the solutions provided might not be the right one. I always say that to, you know, my producing partners and, and directors and editors. It's like, well, everyone got stuck here. Everyone bumped here and gave a note and they gave, you know, 10 different ideas but what's the problem and what, how, do we, how do we wanna fix it in the core of our story? Yeah, and sometimes when um, people get bumped, you're like, oh, is it something in the sound design and not mm -hmm. the cut? Is it something in the, cause sometimes people will be like, oh, that cut doesn't feel right. And then I look and I'm like, oh, there's this weird sound thing here. Of course they bumped, you know, like I missed that. I misplaced that thing or, it's just it's, what's the note behind the note <laughs> what's the note behind the note is so true that is so true and um especially in stylized editing like the one thing about narrative is we can always go back to the script when we're confused we really have that but in style editing it's like sometimes there's unlimited possibilities of how a cut can go and so like you said there's there could be so many possibilities there is no right edit but there's there's the one that Works. you know the one that works yeah and there could be other ways that it would work but um you have to make decisions you really do you have and I, th I think there's a generational thing now too with uh, edit pacing and how things actually come across to different audiences especially in the youtube generation because a lot of those creators are editing at very uh abstract and not traditional pacing and mm -hmm. you're seeing that actually move into movies and tv now so well i like a slower edit and a slower burn and and you know i'm, I'm a student of 70s cinema and 80s so, you know older even um i might like that the audience might be going well this is fucking slow and it's a lot of sorry are we allowed to swear <laughs> you can do right now sorry students um, but they might be they might because they're used to watching uh somebody talk at them directly at a screen where every three syllables they're cutting to a new and it, it it's it's, it changes the language of film entirely so uh, it, some of that might literally be you're bumping against somebody's perception of what film is now because it's changed. Mm -hmm. I have an aha moment after you said that. A mm -hmm. um, mentor once told me um, a good editor, it's not about knowing when to cut, it's about knowing when not to cut. Mm -hmm. And I think that that mm -hmm. is really powerful aha moment. Yeah. You just remind me of that. All other discussion, but yeah. yes. <laughs> I want to jump, we do have a question from our audience here. Um, it's for Kat. In your Q&A last night for Hey's Little Thing, you talked about the importance of going into filmmaking with three scripts in mind. The writer's version, the one you shoot, and the one that edit, which Janelle touched on as well. I think there might be a fourth version, the one yeah. you have to do sound design and do music for. Um, <laughs> but can you expand on this today? And, um, because it really resonated your conversation yesterday. Okay, yeah, for sure. I think that, um, and I bet Warren is probably amazing to speak to this too, but 
you know, you have the script that is written, whether you're the writer or the director reading that script, you've definitely gone through a whole process of drafting it and making changes and discussing whether you're the writer director yourself or, or two separate people, kind of that tension going back and forth. So then you have the script, you shot list the script, break it out, the 80s schedules it, there's, you know, and then you get there on the day and it's like, oh man, I lost all my B-roll or oh man, like this. Can't thing. shoot at this location. <laughs> yeah, literally, like my, I, my location is now flooding from the roof, which happened to me one time, you know? So it's like, you have to adapt and sometimes, or you'll be like, you know what? Hearing that in the actor's mouth, it just doesn't, it's, it's not right. Or an actor will like you'll have a crazy actor that can just like give a, like in when I was working on Warren's film, there can these amazing comedians and mm -hmm. like sometimes they would just like go off script on one one punchline or something like that, you know. So that's the script you shoot is all of that that you can't control. You can but we were also cutting for network television, right? So we <laughs> had very specific act breaks. And, yeah. yeah. Um, and then once all of that happens um, as an editor, you know, I've had experiences where I'm on set and I kind of see all that happen. So I'm coming in with a little bit more of um, intelligence of what, what the changes are, but some, most of the time you're not on set. You have a conversation with a director, but usually at the time that you're getting the footage, the director is like, I need like to sleep mm -hmm. and I need, a, I need some distance, you know, this kind of, and I think that's really healthy as a director. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's why and, script supervisors are so important yeah script supervisors yeah. and then the editor gets there with the notes of what was changed from the script supervisor and the footage and then it's a whole process of you know you thought that would work like that but it actually doesn't it actually maybe works better like this or one thing like Warren taught me which was another aha moment um he was like the punchline plays in the wide a lot of the time until sometimes it doesn't, but most of the time, you know? And so I presented something that wasn't like that. And then just by making that one choice, like the laugh is like, you you feel the, the laugh um, and that's, yeah. So I think that's hopefully more of an exploration. I don't know if anyone so so you mean the idea that a film is written three times, once as a script, yeah. once in production, and once in post-production, basically. Yeah, and it's yeah. written once, but I think that it evolves. It's retold. It, yeah. It's retold, yeah. So there's, you know, it ends up being its own different thing after those three different steps. And then it might, in fact, evolve beyond that with the color and sound and the effects, because, you know, the one you edit, if it doesn't have the VFX in it, as we saw with Hazy, like, I didn't know really what the VFX was going to be like. It right. it changes it in its own way, you know. Yeah. So I'm, I'm actually think glad that Kat brought up the VFX because that's something that um, people forget about a lot. Um, yeah. That's usually the first thing to go when they start cutting down the budget of post. And so if if you're like Kat was saying, you know, you're not on set, you're not always completely aware of the changes that are being made. Now you've got this shot that's a little bit different than you've expected, and there's no money for the VFX to make it work the way it is. Now she's sitting there going, okay, how do I somehow still tell the same story? Yeah. No, it's true. And it, it is, it's, I think it is a challenge of the, the, the fix it and post mentality uh, doesn't account for fix it and post. Uh, zero. I'd like t-shirts, I'm sorry to interrupt, Lauren. I'd like t-shirts that says fix it in prep. Yeah. yeah, I think that would help That's everybody. It would help the editors, the sound designers, the composers, the deliverables. Uh, if we just take more time and prep, um, we're in a quarantine right now. And if you're prepping your movie, use this time to like make sure you got all your stuff oh, yeah. uh, accounted for. Because if we can deal with it while we're prepping it, those things that you're talking about, uh, Brendan, a lot of them we can avoid. The movie's made in pre-production. Basically. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, no. I, I what Jane does with sound and what Jane well, I, does with music. It like I love it when we hand it over to you, and then I get the soundscapes back. That's oh, what I, I really agree. There, a the movie doesn't feel like a movie until the sound design and the music and the color grade is done. Then it feels real. What I meant is basically, you know, without proper pre-production, like you've said, yeah. you're, you're screwed. You're yeah. just you don't have a plan, and then you don't have a contingency plan, and then you don't have a contingency plan on top yeah. of that contingency plan, and you're yeah. just you're, you're floundering. 
especially when we're talking to the Canadian Film Fest audience, which a lot of them are independent filmmakers. You know, you might be doing your first film, you might be doing shorts, you might be on your second film or whatever, but there's never, there's never money to deal with that. Yeah. One it, of the it's okay it's to fly by the seat of your pants, but you don't want to make a habit out of doing that. <laughs> I, I guess once it would be really great for, um, for an audience to know, like, what can you fix in post and what can't you fix in post? Because recently we've, we've, there was a television series we worked on, which was shot under the Gardner Expressway, which is uh, like the, the worst place you could possibly shoot for sound. And um, no one, like not a single person on the set seemed to have noticed or made a comment. Even the sound recordist didn't say anything. <laughs> And, I, and he's a really good sound recordist. And then when we got to the post and it took a long time, but we actually did fix a lot of it. We did a little bit of ADR, but we fixed a lot of it because the tools that are around are um, just, just, they're just so detailed and sophisticated now. But the point really is, and I know it was a, visually, it was great, is like, it was a terrible use of time in post to just get reasonable sound. It wasn't even great sound, it was reasonable. So do you really wanna spend four hours of your mix? Like that's expensive time. Do you really wanna spend four hours getting rid of the noise from the Gardner Expressway? It's true, it, it really does. That's so, it's so, it's, you're so right. I think it's so interesting how, again, when we talk about collaboration, it's like everyone's voice matters and you're also hiring professionals. Like. I, uh, on a film I have in post, we looked at one location right by the gardener and on the first scout, me and the producer were like, we can't shoot here. Like we, we don't have the time to fix this later, even if it's possible. Like we need to find a different location. We're like, this is actually a dialogue scene early in a movie that's setting up some plot. Like this is, this is actually one of the exposition scenes. Like this is not hello. And we can, if you ADR the one line, like it's gonna be a disaster. So. Yeah, it's like bring your sound person on. Uh, whenever what I make an dream. amazing producer, you are. Yeah, you're a responsible that's producer, Lauren, fantastic. because there's never a sound. There's never a sound recordist on a location scout, and that's that's a detriment to spending money later on. It's, it's hard. It's hard to get them. It's hard to get them out. It is. This is my weird secret thing at UBC. Again, if you were the editor, you were the producer, but you actually were. Did I talked about this in a Skillshare with Coral and Dan Beckerman a few weeks ago? You were the location sound person, so I weirdly did that. I don't. Don't hire me. I don't think I'm good now, but many years ago I did that. Um, but I also shoot documentaries where it really can be out of your control. So I'm always, we're always trying to figure that out. Um, I shot a documentary all in India, and I remember talking to the sound person who's amazing, and he would always be so worried. You know, they didn't interview on a bus and different things, and he did an amazing job, and it was totally fine. But I remember him being like, I don't know. I'm like, yeah, but we're gonna see she's on a bus in India. At some point we have to embrace that it is going to be loud and I am sorry you didn't do a sit down and that was the place that the subject really opened up to camera but that was the place they felt comfortable. So, um, and I think those are all very good segues to my question about what is the most common mistake you see that you really wish you could like put on 10 t-shirts for new filmmakers, established filmmakers? What, what is that thing you see all the time? Janelle, I want to guess versus getting hired way too late because I feel like that happens with composing all the time. And then it's like, I need you to create a whole character mood and theme. And we've never talked about this movie before. <laughs> right. And we only have two days to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do think that, that people often underestimate the amount of time it takes to really artfully craft a good score. Um, it almost takes as much as the edit. Um, so when you, when you look at, at scheduling, um, yeah, that's definitely a big one. Um, a big one I, I find um, for um, all, all filmmakers pretty well is, uh, is more on the business side. There's, um, there's a misconception that in order to own the copyright in your film, you also need to own the music. And that's absolutely not true. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so that, that, that is one thing I come across a lot. And then the other mistake I see a lot, um, I, I don't necessarily want to call it a mistake, um, but it's something that is avoidable, is the falling in love with your temp track. Mm -hmm. and, um, anyone who doesn't know the temp track, yeah. also known as temporary score, um, <laughs> is where the filmmaker puts music into the film, um, which can 
serve a lot of, of, of great, great things. It can help with you know, figuring out what, what overall tone of music works, what instrumentation. It can help um, if you have to show your film to somebody like a, a broadcaster or a funder, um, anyone who uh, outside that might need approvals. Um, and it can also help with the edit, um, you know, especially if, if you want, want to consider pacing. But oftentimes, filmmakers um, will keep playing that same music over and over again as they do the color correction as they look at other aspects that might not need sound or music. And then um, the challenge is that then that completely informs your decision. And it's not necessarily always from the point of story and it's not always from a point of what actually works for the film. Um, so turn it off once, once it's there, turn it off, step away from it. And definitely don't pick a song just because it reminds you of you know, your first kiss because it was playing on the radio at the time. That is, is a feeling you might get from music that is not um, transferable to the general public. And most people won't have the same response. So just something to keep in mind there. That's such a good one. I have had that conversation so many times um, and definitely early in the assembly once. And I, I'm, I don't want to give notes. It's too early in the assembly, but please don't use some of the, these bands. We can never, like they're not even in the realm of possibility for us. These will not be songs we can get. Please, please don't fall in love. Take them out. Um, what about for everyone else? I'm sure all of you have good gems of like, what? Um, yeah, Justin. Yeah, I've got, I've got one. Uh, and it's a lot to do with budgeting for post. Uh, for the scope of your project, but also budgeting for the probable uh, chance that your film may fi fail QC going up the chain to iTunes or something else and budgeting for those fixes. Because if you're using someone like Mojo or Juice or somebody to deliver your film to those platforms and edits need to be done, you're going to have to pay them to do that or you're going to have to fix it on your end. And one, one, one way or another, uh, if you're going to have to pay the post company for that. And even yeah. beyond that, there's... Uh, all the stuff you actually need to pay for to release your film, E&O insurance, title clearance. If you're making a documentary, you might need a fair use opinion. If you need a fair use opinion, because fair dealings in Canada is different than fair use, you may need to get all of your E&O in the States instead. There's all these different things, depending on what your film is, that you may not realize will cost you down the line. And if you don't think about it before you start shooting and get your post deals done and make sure you have a contingency for overages and all of those things, you could find yourself unable to finish your film without going out for more investment. So a big part of it is just in your budget, don't underestimate your post. Um, I'm in a kind of a privileged position because I run a post company. So when I make a film, I can go, well, my post is actually a little cheaper um, than what I would normally do if I had to go farm it out and work with you know, Brand Brandon's company, not saying you're more expensive, but because I'd have to be going to a different person. Okay. Um, it's just the way it would be. Uh, yeah, I've seen a lot of people shoot themselves in the foot and, re and then they have to do their deliverables a second time. And it's like, well, there's two grand or however much. I'm, not, I'm, I'm just throwing a number out. That's not my price. I'm just saying <laughs> that they have to pay it again or they, you know, or they're, they're um, a really common one is closed captions fail QC because they're over 400 words per minute. And they didn't go through and actually line by line with with a proper caption software. You know, if they had it done on Rev.com, which is great, but frequently those are over 400 words per minute. So they're closed captions fail QC, which means they have to get their captions done again or fixed, and that costs money. So it's just plan for things to screw up through the post per uh, period, just like they screw up through production, because it does happen frequently. Yeah. Uh, no, um, not just finishing, but. Um, one thing that in my career I've found multiple times, especially in independent projects, is that one of the first people that they lose on their team to save money is a DMT. Um, and I've had, and you know. Well, they're multitasking. It's an AC DMT. Yeah, multitasking or, you know, uh, kind of like a entry level position person. Um, and then. I'll receive the footage and either it's not transcoded like 30 days of footage or um, they transcoded it with a different name than the file. So there's gonna be problems down the road when we're relinking footage for color, when we're relinking to the source footage. So um, 
I mean, I think that comes from a responsibility as an editor to send out your specs and to have those conversations with producers. And when they say um, we can't afford that or whatever, just kind of explaining the how important it is for the entire process for post that those like that's your movie, you know, those are we have to protect that footage and those files and then be able to use them. And then I think another so providing specs as an editor is really important and having those conversations so that you're getting what you need to be able to do your job. And then having like I'm very lucky I work with amazing assistants, Anna Catley, uh, Leah Lalek, and Keisha Rose. And you know, one of the services. They're not assistants anymore, Kat. They're not, they're all editors, <laughs> I know. They're all amazing editors. But one thing that um, having an assistant, sometimes you can offer, like we can transcode the footage, but it takes so much time, right? If you're not doing it as you're yeah. shooting it, like all of a sudden we have 30 days or 14 days or however many days of footage and it's- And, and on, on bigger shows, you're paying for it. It's just not time, it's it's money. It's, it's it costs yeah. money to transcode it. Yeah. Now, now your assembly date gets pushed back, what like one day for every two days of footage. And it's just, keep, yeah. So I think that there's like certain technical steps that sometimes when we get when we're new and we're excited about creating something and we're just out shooting it, we end up making mistakes that then kind of haunt the entire process. Well, important mentioning DMT too is backups, triple backups at least, uh, yeah. making sure that the drives go to different places, making sure you back up to LTO because the last thing you want is to lose an entire day of shooting, especially if you spent a bunch of, it's a big day, well, and you can't redo it. Um, so yeah, always at least, you know, your master drive and two backups and then different producers take those drives home at the end of each day so that if there's a fire in one place or a car crash in another place, you've got your backup drive alive somewhere else. They don't all go to one spot at the end of the day. Uh, and and I, then when you're done, all those backups go to different places too. Uh, you mm -hmm. can put them in vaults, you can do whatever you want, but something to protect them. And as an editor, I think being really clear about uh, backups that uh, like, as an editor, making it clear in your spec sheet that you are not um, responsible for the source footage and the backups mm -hmm. and that you are responsible for your project and your proxies because you know, as an editor, we can't be responsible for the materials of every single thing that we work on. But I've gotten um, into situations in the past where something wasn't backed up on the production side and either I was luckily to have it backed up or, and I could always go back to my spec sheet at the bottom, which like very clearly states the responsibilities. So I think that comes back to communication too, just being really clear about oh, yeah. in the business as well, being really clear about what is our role? Like what are the expectations, even in indie filmmaking, you know, so that we can all just learn um, how to be accountable, reliable, and also know exactly whose position um, requires I think the well, editor's got to be responsible though as well for right. keeping their project files in a dated fashion. So if you need to go back five days in the edit, you can get to that project file and you haven't overwritten all that work. I think it's really uh, important to- Oh yeah, the editor that's, the other biggest that. mistake. yeah. that's the other biggest mistake is yeah. people get as editors right into the creative of putting together a story but have no organization mm -hmm. and no system. And then it's like a complete disaster. You as know? much as communication is important, organization is just oh, yeah. as important. Yeah. So you can say by my clean table. <laughs> so, so Warren or Brendan or Jane, what are your what is the most common mistake you keep seeing over and over? Um, Brendan, would, you you oh Jane, go ahead. I, I was just gonna say I don't think it's not a common mistake, but you know, Kat's describing like the last thing she was just describing is a very technical and scientific kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so it, she's pointing out that one of the things that's an aspect of that is that this post-production is both highly creative and highly technical and it's that marriage of the two and so one part of part that's related to that is ADR which is dialogue replacement automated dialogue replacement and um, many many filmmakers are terrified of ADR it's like they don't want to do ADR because they consider it a failure like they should just be either they love their production sound so much or they love their performance so much they don't want to replace it with anything. But I, I always like to think of ADR as a wonderful tool and it's another ingredient you can use when you're in your mix or in your, in your sound edit. So maybe you, you re-record a whole bunch of lines, but you end up only using one word 
and mm -hmm. that word makes the sentence clearer. It's just it's just like a wonderful thing, and it's um, it, it, it takes time and it takes working with the actors, and you have to make sure the actors don't think that they screwed up too, because then their performance will never be as relaxed as it should be. But it's really it's a kind of a magical thing when you can weave together both production and, and ADR and not a single person, even the director may not even know like wh where the cross is, so. For sure, and I think what you said even your gardener story in that, I, I do think the, the tools, the technical tools that sound has now, I've often now gone into my sound spots being like, you know, can, do you think you can salvage this line? We assume these are ADR and, and I'm, I'm continually amazed at what sound teams can say, no, no, we can, let me check, but I think we can, we can save that one. We don't know if you need it. And, you know, especially if it's, a, if it's an emotional scene, it's so hard to ask actors to be like, okay, you're gonna come in and do like this line from this scene that was funny and then this really sad one. And, and I think that's a lot. So the, the tools, the technical tools that sound has like continue to blow me away. I, I was really surprised on, um, on Sugar Daddy that's in post how few of the lines we thought that were not going to be saved uh, were able to be saved and were great. And then then also then there's always something that sound hears that you hadn't. It's like, well, there's a weird clicking under that whole line. And how have you heard your movie like 500 times and not noticed? So, um, but the technical part, it's true. It really is a technical creative merge. Cedar's um, magic, right? Those plugins are just Anyway. <laughs> hey guys, sorry to interrupt. Uh, this guy literally just started opening up and my window's open, so I'm just going to go on really quick. Uh, while he's doing that, pants. while he's doing that, Lauren, I, I can say one thing, and this is for the filmmakers um, watching, the maybe the directors or the people making their first features, is the one thing I learned is, um, and I'm not talking about television because television, you, you have to hand in your director's cut and there's the, you, you only have a certain amount of time. But when you're talking about your own feature, um, just don't show that first cut until it's ready. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I'm talking even to the producers and out of uh, deference to Brendan and yourself, Lauren, even if you were asking me to show you the cut um, of, of the feature we just did together, uh, if I was so honored to do one with you um, and it's not ready, I've now learned uh, after going through this 11 times that I just say, I'm so sorry, I need more time. Um, even if it throws the schedule back because um, uh, you, you really don't get another chance uh, of, of uh, presenting it. And, and my only anecdote is uh, my very first film, Ham and Cheese, we unfortunately showed Mr. Gravestock at TIFF a two hour cut of Ham and Cheese. Uh, and it, it was a learning, it was, that was an aha moment for me. I learned never to do that again. He was yeah. very nice. He left the screening and he kind of just patted me on the shoulder. It's like, Good on you, <laughs> because it's barely watchable at the 88 minutes we finally got it down <laughs> to. Not that bad, man. Uh, and uh, but I, I learned a valuable lesson is is because I had pressure from, you know, the team to like we got to get into TIFF, we got to get into TIFF. I'm like I don't think this is a TIFF movie, mm -hmm. but okay. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, I I that film really crystallized that you don't recover from a first bad screening. At the same time, for for filmmakers that are that are making their first films. Don't get deflated or defeated after your first cut. It's supposed to be, I mean, and Kat can attest to this, um, you know, the fir first cut is, is oftentimes very rough. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I first started doing this, I'm like, oh my God, my movie, it's terrible. It's not gonna, oh, what's gonna happen? And then, you know, on, on things I do for money that um, uh, Kat's um, uh, colleague, Anna Catley uh, edited, the first cut came out and I think even Anna was kind of concerned with it because it was, you know, long and, and I watched, I'm like, that's the movies in there. I see it. Now let's get to work. Let's, I always, you know. I always say when I'm screening like a first cut to the director or my first assembly or something, I'm always like, this is the worst you're ever going to see it. The entire <laughs> film, you know, because every step of the way, like as you move through the process of assembly, rough cut, fine cut, like each step it's the worst you're gonna see it until you put that final restripe and titles on and it's done, you know? So it's I nice prefer, to remember that. I'm sorry. Go uh, ahead. No. Zoom is hard to not. It um, is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I prefer a bloated first cut to show to my initial team, my producers and whatever, simply because it it's that idea of those conflicting views because you start to figure out what the problem areas are outside of your own sort of perspective really early 
And then by the time you're testing with an audience and you've got like, you know, you show 130 minute cut to four people, then you show an audience 105 minute cut, you, that'll get you down to that 90 something minutes or whatever it is you're targeting for um, a lot more efficiently, I find. But that's over several films, I've figured that out. I, before, it was, you know, I would just release a long movie and it would be like, what are you doing, you fucking moron? <laughs> but, <laughs> anyway. You guys are so right about that. Because, I mean, I remember growing up um, way back in the day, um, they used to do dailies after you shoot. Mm -hmm. So I remember going with my dad to Deluxe or Technicolor and seeing the stuff they'd shot and then some rough assemblies. And it was like, holy crap, this looks terrible. <laughs> and then you see it again, you know, a couple weeks later, a month later, when things have been kind of polished and some music's in there. And you're like, this is the same footage? Oh, my God. So you guys are totally right. Like that first cut. Don't let it scare you. Yeah. But I feel like, I don't know, Warren, after all these years, I, I find, you know, I am in post on two movies and we're cutting remote and it's so weird and it's such a bizarre process right now. But like, I kind of have to remind myself. I do get to a moment, not always the first cut, because I'm like smart enough to remember the first cut's going to be rough. But like, there's almost like the moment right before you get to fine cut, when you've had the rough cut, you've given notes, you've talked about it with your team, you finally sent it out to funders. And you're working through their everyone's notes and there's like that low of like oh god can we find it like did we totally ruin this and then i just came out of this on a film and i'm like why don't i remember and i talked to the other producer <laughs> and the director and we're like why what we this is none of our first movie why could we not remember that we would get to the other side it just felt yes. like that hill the hill to climb of post felt so big especially like, go ahead just especially because it's on zoom and remote and it's weird and it's just yeah. not a process we're used to but yeah just like you do not remember the struggles you've had on set. Like, I, I, I can remember, you know, <laughs> yeah. It, it's I remember. Like, well, I, you remember it, but I watch, I watch the film now as this is, this is the document of what we want to say. Yeah. And like all the stuff that you go through and, you know, like Kat saying, is like, we lost the location, we, we can't do this. Like you just, I forget. As a filmmaker, as a director, I, I invest in the story that ends up being the film. Well, that's why yeah. the applause gets you more though too <laughs> because you, nobody cares about the context of how that came together they only care about what they're watching in front of you so it, it, you know none of the stories of oh this scene didn't work because of all this on the day nobody cares that's yeah. that's your stories for your circle and the people who, who are interested in making films and that's about it the the adage of you know the funny thing on set that the crew all laughs at usually doesn't make the final cut because it's yeah. not that funny <laughs> <laughs> I remember we had something that was so funny. A, um, an actor kind of got stuck in a, one of our old trucks on Ryan Girls, and it was so funny. It made the rap party video, and we kept thinking it would make the edit, and it made no sense. Tonally, it was like the film. It would make no sense, and we put it in once, and we're like, huh, yeah, that's, that was just kind of a funny moment that makes no tonal sense in the context of the scene. But on set, we're like, this is hilarious. This will be the shot. It wasn't. Um, Brendan, before I, I have, we have some questions from the audiences, I have more questions, but is there any, when your, your, your biggest tip, mistake, warning, I wish I could yeah. tell everyone on a t-shirt. Um, sorry if I'm shivering, I'm a little bit wet. Um, <laughs> uh, it's bad out there, out there, man. It's really, I, I see it. It's not I good. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of bits inside of my truck right now. Um, uh, the biggest thing I would say, just kind of from what I've seen, uh, on my side of the post is hire a, the best su post supervisor you can and the best editor and listen to them. Um, my dad's ingrained this into me for a long time. He will always hire people that are better than you and then listen to them. Otherwise, why are you paying for them to be better? You're wasting your own time. You're wasting their time. You're wasting your money. Um, and you know, one thing that I'm seeing a lot now is productions will start up thinking, oh, I know we need like an editor and an assistant. And within a month of shooting, I've now got five or seven systems loaded up for them. So be realistic about what you need and the windows of opportunity, the amount of time you have to complete that. Um, it's very rare I see, you know, and again, I'm talking like very, you know, bigger TV, bigger motion picture stuff. It's very rare you see two. It's very common now to see five or um, a new trend now is one of the assistants will get a second computer. Uh, and that'll be another Avid system or Premiere, whatever it is they choose to work on. And that will be solely for data transfers or outputs or, you know, rendering specific things so they can continue working on assemblies or cutting or, you know, just organizing files for the editor. Like Kat was saying, is a lot of people don't do that properly. 
Um, the really good assistants, they're in there. Everything is in proper bins. It's all properly labeled. It's been imported properly. They've checked aspect ratios. I can't tell you how many times I've seen problems where the um, <clears throat> DMT or the post house, whoever's doing the process that gets the drive ends up at the editorial and nobody's noticed that the aspect ratio has changed. So things like that, hiring people that care about what they do and understand the technology behind it will just save you a ton of money, a ton of time, and you get to keep some of your hair um, and it'll make the whole process a little bit easier. Um, and again, you know, the companies like the one I work with, Pivotal Post, this is what we specialize in. We sit down a lot with the post supervisor and the lead editor, and it's like, what do you guys need and what are you trying to do? And they'll say, oh, we want this gear, this gear, this gear, and we'll make recommendations. Like, yeah, that's perfect. We have a lot of other shows doing the same thing. Or you know what would work better that's more cost effective? Here's that solution. And then kind of Lauren, to touch on what you were talking about is there's a very big trend even before COVID where things are starting to go remotely. Um, mm -hmm. I can't say the name of the show, but they shoot in Vancouver and they post here in Toronto. So a lot of the time the editor cannot be in the editorial. So they use things like Soho Net. Um, we have our own proprietary streaming software, which the uh, whoever is in a remote location can see exactly what the editor has on his system. Um, there's even some really amazing pieces of software out there where the director can literally draw on his iPad and say, I want the VFX to come in from here and the editor will see his notes up on the screen and um, you know, take advantage of the knowledge that's out there. Um, it'll save you a ton of time, a ton of headaches. And again, just listen to the people. If they're telling you it won't work and they've been doing it for 10 or 20 years, probably not gonna work. Or yeah. script, it's scriptation, like scriptation and uh, shot lister and uh, shot designer are, are friends as directors for sure. Yeah. Oh, I don't make your own DCPs unless, I'm oh, sorry, I'm done. I was gonna say, don't make your own DCPs unless you know what you're doing. Oh, yeah. You're just gonna cause yourself a big headache. I remember the start of that trend. I was like, not interested. I'm sure I could learn, not interested. I'm happy to pay someone to make that for me. Um, we have a bunch of questions that I do wanna dive into, but I also do wanna make sure we cover enough time to answer this question about, um, uh, you know, what is post-production? What do you see in our industry? How are we making it more inclusive? How are we, you know, helping to break down barriers of entry? for you know, our uh, BIPOC colleagues, newer filmmakers, women, um, you know, and I, I'm gonna make Jane answer first because you have been an amazing person in this business for a long time and I would love to see here what you think is changing and maybe where you don't think it's changing and we can, we can fight for that change. You know, it's, it's, a, tough, it's a tough thing to do because um, you're, you're drawing from a pool of people who are interested in the, the subject, the post-production. And if people are never exposed to post-production, then there never occurs to them in a million years to uh, apply for a job or to shadow somebody. Um, and so I, I, I say it needs to come from earlier down, it needs to come from like the high schools or there's a wonderful thing called the Regent Park Film Festival where um, mm -hmm. they, well, I don't know what exactly what the, the connection is, but there's a couple of productions like Kim's Convenience is one of them where they make sure they have some people who are, hang out on set for a few weeks. And then she, the producer, Sandra Cunningham, she insists that they, they go and hang out in post-production and they come to a mix. So those people who you know come like for maybe for a day or even just half a day, they, those people who are from a communities that don't get exposure to post-production, they walk away going, oh my God, I didn't know this existed. So uh, that's the kind of thing that we need to have more of because if people, like people are drawn to post-production or they're not, like it's a very detailed job. It's sometimes behind the scenes, you don't get the same recognition as, as like the directors and the producers and so on, actors for sure. Um, but it's, it's like fantastically creative and rewarding area to work in. And, and anyone who comes in from any other other community is either going to either like it or not. And the, so it's up to us to open the door to the people who actually are interested. So mm -hmm. let's create a bigger pool. And those people who want to work in post-production, like they should just go and work post-production. It's awesome. 
Um, yeah, I think that I think that's so valuable. I've been thinking a lot this week about the idea that we feel often when we have uh, from our positions of privilege that we feel like our door is open, but is our door does it actually feel open to the people we, we think it's open to and, and figuring out how to reach those communities and do the work on our side to be like, you know, you might not think my door is open, but it is. And I think for post, that's something that's so important. Um, so yeah, I'd love to hear from anyone else. Yeah, Warren. Um, there is a fantastic site called uh, filmincolor.ca um, mm -hmm. that is just uh, um, starting to um, capture uh, the very uh, amazing, talented, diverse BIPOC uh, voices that are out there. And it's all crew. It's, it's and, and we're hoping that it's, um, uh, you know, crew members, uh, filmmakers, editors, um, and you can sign up there. And it's it's a handy tool for all of us to kind of look at to see, you know, when we're crewing up and we're looking for talent uh, uh, to see it. It's um, part of, uh, uh, the, there's a great organization, I'm wearing the t-shirt, BIPOC uh, TV and Film, that everybody should uh, just check out and join, uh, um, join the uh, Instagram feed and, and follow them because they put out a lot of information that you're just talking about, Lauren. And, and you know, it's, it's, I think it's important right now to use this moment to amplify these voices. And I know everybody that's on this uh, 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 Zoom panel is an ally to this and you, everyone's done incredible work and, and the work continues. It just, it just doesn't stop this week when the news cycle, like you said, is over. Mm -hmm. So filmincolor.ca, if anybody wants to check it out, uh, it's it's a pretty handy resource. Maybe one we thing I've that. noticed on, on the technical side of things is when I first started the post world for editors, at least, it seemed very male centric. And I'd have to say within the last five years. Brendan, the film industry, man, it's yeah. like, you know. It's, but it's within not, the it's last not, five years, I've yeah. seen, there's so many more female editors and not just assistants anymore. Like I used to just mainly see them as assistants and you'd catch the occasional editor that mm. was female, but now it's like, they're, it's so commonplace. Like, um, and even people of color or, you know, different races, it's not like 10 white people working in a hallway. Um, it, it is the time though, you're right. It's the time for uh, BIPOC voices, um, uh, you know, the lesbian, gay, transgender, um, uh, non-binary um, uh, community to be, get involved and, and be hired, you know, just hire them, just go out, find them, look at their work, hire them. Yeah. The I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm I think one of the biggest problems for the younger generation, at least the ones that I've been talking to, is a lot of them don't know that the world is available to them. They yes. think, oh, if my family's not involved, um, I can't get in, or some director doesn't find me sitting on a bus stop waiting, you know, magic, you know, that moment. It's like, no, all you need to do is call the DGC or whatever union, you know, uh, oversees that department that you want to join. And there's all these great, um, like the, the one thing you guys were talking about where they bring people out on set. Um, you have like the CFC, which is another great program. Um, but that's one thing I'm constantly telling the younger generation that are eager to come in. They're just, I don't know how to get, well, just call the union. Like they'll tell you, here's the classes. And, you know, like Warren was saying, you know, reach out to someone that you, you like and say, hey. Yeah. And, and organizations like like BIPOC uh, that, BIPOC. that specifically are, you know, is is run by uh, BIPOC voices and, and, and they're, they're, they're there to help. They're there to help everyone's journey. And I think we're all, I think that's the other thing, Lauren, is like we all, we all want to do this. It's hard work. Uh, but uh, I, I just this week, I've, I've been brought to tears to see the support and, and just the, the absolute, you know, the solidarity that I'm seeing is, is, it's really, it's fantastic. And, and we need to continue beyond this news cycle. <laughs> yes, yes. And, I, and I think I think the one, people like us who are in the business already is, uh, yeah, it's really, really challenging what are those, those systemic barriers to entry. Um, but I think, Jane, what you're talking about is so great. And I'm such a fan of Sandra Cunningham's and really, really making, helping people get access. Know that there are jobs here, but, but we can help, you know, reach for access. Um, Janelle, I know you sent out, shared a lot of links for different ways that um, we can support and different lists of crew and obviously music uh, besides not having, um, has not good representation for the BIPOC community, women is still such a minority. Uh, I think I heard in composer organizations in the United States, it's like 1%, 2%, it's something really, really low. Um, so yeah, well, how, how are you feeling about that? <laughs> well, this, oh, you wanted, there was a, anyway, but yes. 
Yeah. So yeah they're celebrating their one Oscar this year, but I don't think, I think you can accept that that's not good enough. One is not enough. <laughs> No, no, absolutely not. And, and I think um, the interesting thing about composers specifically is that we've got all of history against us. Um, most of the time when people think of composers, most of us are, have, you know, Western classical music training. So we think of Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, um, like all, all a bunch of dudes, right? I even have a book called Bach, Beethoven and the Boys. Um, it's, it's not a funny anecdote book that it's you know touted to be but that just means that we have to work harder to make sure that when people who are in a position to hire are looking for composers they see people like me or people of of the BIPOC community who don't necessarily look like what you would expect a composer to look like and um, that that does have some um, you know there is a responsibility of of um, organizing people together to help um, you know lift voices and things like that but it also is top down so it has to come from people who are in a position to hire to look at what, the talent that's available and also look at um, lists of credits with an eye to okay if people haven't had the, uh, the same opportunities as other people coming into the industry how do those credits on a web series transfer to television? How do you know how many short films do you have to do before you're trusted with a feature film or you know something that's more long form? Um, look beyond just oh I'm looking for you know someone who's done this exact same thing as what my project is, um, and also to for for other people in the industry, um, look at. I mean I've recognized that not every voice is perfect for every project. So even though, you know, I might have done a number of things, um, perhaps this, th this new project, I'm not the right voice for. So who can I recommend? Who can, who can I um, open a door for? And I think everyone um, has been um, in, a, in a position where they've done something, and you're like, I don't think I should have done that. Um, so now that we're all aware of, of what we can do as as people who are already established in the industry now i think is the time where we can open those doors and be like come come in you're welcome um and i know i mentioned some some um organizations or i i sent some some links so one is the screen composers guild of canada um it's a great uh, community great resource they also have a find a composer page um the composer diversity database is a really great place specifically if you're looking for composers um of diversity um women um and and uh, people who fit into very specific um identifying communities um of course film and color does have a composer section but it's very very small so composers yeah. you have to go and join let's sign up, let's sign up. <laughs> yes go sign up um and then I think I met, oh, the Alliance uh, for, for Women Film Composers. That's uh, an organization that's um, US centric, but they're working on, on um, diversity from the top down. So looking at Hollywood and, and looking at how that will um, help visibility. So they also have a database as well. Uh, just on that, uh, sorry to jump in Lauren, but uh, Janelle uh, with the, um, uh, the screen, music um, supervisors, there's a union as well, right? Or a, or a uh, um, association as well. And I just want to shout out, um, a shout out, but pay my respects to David Heyman. His GoFundMe is still active, I believe. And uh, he's a loss to uh, this industry and the, the, the music uh, side of things, especially he was a phenomenal supervisor, just did Utopia Falls and, and textuality with me uh, way back in the day. So um, uh, res respects to David Heyman. Uh, Check out his scope on me. Don't mean to bring it down, but you know, uh, you, you know that's that's our community, right? And when we lose someone like that, uh, it affects all of us. But all those, all those, um, all those places you mentioned, uh, amazing places to to follow, check out, join. Yeah, I would say also today, free the free the work, which is um, working for for female uh, and BIPOC directors in the United States. They posted a bunch of Instagram posts today about um, different networks, you know, distributors, organizations all run by the BIPOC community um, with which obviously one of the big ones being Array. 
which is Ava DuVernay's amazing distribution company. So it's a great uh, resource as well. They posted a bunch of links today on Instagram. Um, I'm going to also jump to some questions. Um, there's a there's a range of them. So how do you want it speak sort of segueing a little bit from this about how we open the door for more community? People are wondering how do they approach you? How do the producer, or filmmaker, director uh, approach any of you? Do you work independently? Do you work in your post facilities? Do you how how's the best way to reach out um, for consideration? And and what does that look like for all of you? Well, I mean, I live in public, basically, if, if that makes any sense. I have social media pages. I have uh, the unstableground.net website. I've got anyone can reach out to me pretty easily is what I, I think the way I would phrase that. Um, and anyone is more than, I'm more than willing to talk to anybody. Uh, the only thing that I would put a caveat on, on that is I get flooded with stuff all the time for various different reasons. And please don't take it personally if I don't necessarily get to or give you the full amount of time you think you deserve. Um, it's not anything personal. It's just, I've got it, my own stuff I have to do and my own clients and my own work and may not necessarily uh, gel at that given time. And I apologize in advance if you feel slighted for, by that, but it's not, it's not intentional. It, it, it's never intentional. Um, it's, so the door is open, but it's, it's a, a, a lot of people trying to get it through a door and I'm a nobody. So imagine, uh, imagine a, somebody, how much stuff people are trying to get through their door, if that makes sense. Yeah, Jane and Brenda, do you want to talk about what it's like when people, how people reach out to both of you? I'll let Jane start. Um, well, you, anybody can contact me. I actually prefer email because if I get um, communications from like Facebook and um, Instagram plus plus email, then I actually can't keep track of them all. Um, but if anybody can send me an email, it may take me a couple of weeks to get back to you, but I will always get back to you. One of the things that one of my business partners said years ago, because he used to get calls from people like phone calls and he would say, um, like somebody would call and ask for an opportunity and then they'd call back and then they'd call back a third time and he'd, and he'd say to them, you know what, I'm gonna give you, you know, I'm gonna talk to you because you called three times and that means you really want this. And if somebody's only gonna call once, then I don't think they want it that badly. And I, I was kind of like, I, to this day, remain a little struck by that because I think I was always remain pretty shy. And if someone hasn't contacted me after I've left one message, I'm probably not going to call again. But there is an aspect to that, which is true. If you really want something, if you really want to get through to someone, you, you might have to try a little harder. So anyway, but email for me. Respectfully, though. <laughs> don't, don't be. Yeah, please. Don't be a stalker. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, in terms of uh, Pivotal Post, you know, we have a, a website, pivotalpost.com. You can reach us there. Um, you can reach me, Brendan, my name on the screen at Pivotal Post. Um, and we're more than happy to, you know, speak to anybody regarding whatever sort of editorial needs they have. Um, there's a little shout out for everybody. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we have worldwide services. You know, we're in LA, New York, uh, Atlanta, Toronto, Vancouver, London. New Zealand, um, so, you know, and, and irregardless of the size of your production, by all means, you know, if you guys need help with something, email me or call us um, and just say, hey, you know, this is how much I got, this is what I need, can you help me out? And you know, we're all about supporting people and if we can do it, we're gonna do it. And, you know, we're more than happy to be a part of this amazing community that, uh, like you all said so many times, is if we're not bringing each other up and we're not supporting the ones that are eager and hungry and you know, dying to get into this industry, then it's our fault if it doesn't get any better. Yeah. And Kat, what about you? You have an agent, don't you? Is that the best process to approach? Or do you like when people approach you direct or depends I mean, on you? It really depends on what they're approaching with. I mean, uh, to what Jane said about the three times, I've had a lot of um, people reach out to me after editing some Drake videos. And so that got like a lot of young people, you know, and sometimes my Instagram would get flooded, but um, you, I try to answer back as much as I can. If it's about a job narrative, I'm repped by Vanguard, Amy at Vanguard, and um, music video commercial, I'm repped by Pop Rock, so uh, for jobs, um, going through those guys is preferred. Um, and then if it's advice, my Instagram is catweber underscore 
I usually find like the advice ones are easier there. And then if it's looking for shadow opportunities or anything like that, um, sometimes, uh, like Jane said, like I have to hear it a few more times just because like you said, you have your work and whatever, but one of my uh, closest coworkers now, Leah Lalek, um, she actually reached out to me for coffee. I was super busy. I don't even think I ended up getting back to her then volunteered on my set as a PA. I was gonna say, this is pre-COVID, right? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. This just is, had coffee like last week. <laughs> this is like pre, this right. is when I first started working with. Yeah. Yeah, so um, years ago and showed up to my set as a PA and then ended up um, becoming my assistant. <laughs> like my assistant in both editing and directing and we've flown to LA together and stuff. So. I wasn't even looking for anything. And then she came in as an intern. Um, and like, sometimes people just make themselves so you like useful that you actually just can't get, like you can't not have them. And I think that's when, <laughs> that's the one thing that um, people can do is just like, when I first was an intern, I went to all the other assistants at the post house and I was like, what's the one job you hate doing? Um, I'll start there. And they said elements, which is like sending all the drives back to the different houses and you know um it's kind of like very just paperwork or whatever but that's what I started doing so I think instead of being like how can I get where you are a good a good in is just like okay what can I do that you don't want to do anymore you know <laughs> and smart. then you, that's cool. yeah that's smart yeah and Janelle I don't are you right what's the best way like how do you get sent projects is it word of mouth is it people you know um, it's it's mostly word of mouth or or um, you know people that I've worked with come back many times. <laughs> um, I'm always happy to uh, to hear from from people who are just starting out to people who are well established. Um, Marcando Music, uh, either email or I'm also on all the socials. Janelle Music um, is my my handle. So um, <laughs> what I love I love when 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 people are are ready to to talk about music is knowing more about the project just like um you know it it take it take the, i mean not every project's the same so just saying hey i have a short film and this much money can you do it it's like well what what do you need what you know like um it's be prepared to start a larger conversation for sure oh i should add one more tiny thing shamelessly is that if you want to learn more about how to like really get in i guess talking to me watch the movie that CFF's playing tonight. Yes. You'll probably be able to stalk me to my apartment. Right <laughs> yeah. <So. laughs> on Google Maps. Uh, yeah, exactly. That intersection is. <laughs> it's all hidden in there. <laughs> not sure we're going to promote stalking. Uh, yeah, oh, I'm not promoting it. I'm not saying do it. I'm just saying. <laughs> uh, we almost have to wrap up, but we do have a couple more questions. So maybe we'll just get like a few, only one or two of you to answer each so we can hit both the questions mm -hmm. for everybody. Um, how often do you find you have to reshoot and add scenes after watching your first cut? And is this something you budget for in prep? I wish I budgeted for all the time. Once Don Carmody spoke to me at Tip Studio and said, always budget for reshoots. I make small movies and I don't always have the money, but I have reshot on most of my films, but not all of them. But what? I think, I, I think uh, uh, when you're first starting out, you, you think that's a, a a badge of shame that you've done something wrong. And it's not, you're, like you said, uh, Kat, there, you know, you, you keep retelling the story and sometimes in the edit or during the post process, you realize, oh, we're missing an entire scene that we really need. So um, uh, have I done, I've, I've done pickups. I've done a lot of pickups. I, I, I don't know, usually if I need to reshoot a scene, that just means I can get rid of it. <laughs> you know, so, um, uh, but uh, you should not, as a filmmaker, you should not be afraid of it. And I, I don't know, I can't speak to the editing side of if you like, um, when that happens, but I, I think it's a good thing. I think you need to embrace, lean into it. It's not a problem. It's, it's an advantage for you as a filmmaker. Yeah, and then we have another question I think is really valid and I do wanna echo something Warren you said about showing cuts too early. I'm a big believer in not, and I've done it, but not showing, fest don't make your edits mm -hmm. around the festival deadline. So the question here is, have you ever had to show a rough cut without your, uh, you know, visual effects, and how do you navigate through it? Um, I, 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 I can do that, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. Also, because I program for Toronto After Dark, so I, I have it from both sides. Uh, every time we get a rough cut without VFX, it's it's 
rather difficult to tell what the film's going to be, but you still get a general sense of how good it is. A film called Monstrum that's now on Shutter. I saw that a year and a half ago, and the monster wasn't in the movie. It's just people reacting to markers and stuff like that. And you kind of have to assume, okay, the monster is going to look good when it's done, right? And that, that's a difficult thing. Uh, for stuff I've shown without VFX, uh, luckily I didn't have enough VFX shots in the film to... Well, Life Changer is all mostly physical, right? Yeah, it's Which mostly awesome. physical. We had yeah. 18 VFX shots in the entire movie. So I knew the missing VFX wouldn't be so bad that, uh, you know, that it would be uh, something that would hinder the watching experience. But I also, I don't like to show finished films because I, as a programmer, I know how much that tampers the, the actual experience for the person watching it. I just don't like doing it. So if I can avoid that in any way, shape, or form, I will. Because if you show it too early, you might shoot yourself in the foot depending on your film. Well, I think it comes back to film festival programmers, buyers, um, they watch it once. You know, yeah. your partners who finance the film, yes, they'll watch multiple cuts. Even that might feel like you get the most notes first time and the next time they're like, yeah, yeah, cool, it got better. Um, but it really, you have to put your best foot forward. Um, and then back to the collaboration, choose your team where, warm when you're ready to show your producers or people who are in the team that it's a safe space, yeah. even when we know it's not ready. Yeah. Um, but yeah, does anyone have else? Uh, Brendan, do you have anything to add about that before we wrap up, about VFX and showing cuts without them? Um, I, the conversations I've had, usually I'm not the one that decides these kinds of things. Um, the, the conversations I've seen my dad have um, usually is, it's a case by case basis. It depends on who's watching it and what the uh, context is that they're watching it in. Um, if you're giving it to someone for sales, I would probably suggest against doing that. Um, mm -hmm. because like you said earlier and Warren touched on, some people are only gonna see it once. So, and again, they might not have that eye that Justin's talking about where it's like, oh, that monster would be good. So I can ignore those markers. Um, so it really depends. I think, um, discuss with your producers, discuss with your post-supervisor, your director, um, and, and make sure it's kind of a, an agreed upon jointly uh, kind of decision. Mm -hmm. um, can, 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 yes, can, oh, do you, do you have another question or, or, or um, I just have one thing and it has nothing to do with the, the, the VFX um, rough cut question you had, but one thing um, that was just on my mind is, um, and I'll, I'll do it from a directing perspective, but it easily can relate to post-production is, you know, and because you, everyone was talking about how can people get a hold of you and how can they talk to you, which I, I firmly believe in because this is an apprenticeship arc. You're either actually doing the thing or you're talking to other people that have done the thing to learn how to do it, and then you have to eventually go out and do it. But uh, when I do meet with uh, filmmakers and, um, let, you know, let's face it, most of them are emerging filmmakers, new filmmakers, filmmakers that are starting out. One of the questions I ask them, and it's not to put them on the spot, but it's to really crystallize what everybody on this panel has done with their life, is I ask them to name 10 Canadian film directors. <laughs> and they name my name, Wayne Sonoma, which is, <laughs> and, then, and then I'm like, you can't count me, you, you know, name me 10 Canadian filmmakers. I'm like, okay, well, name five. Mm -hmm. Well, name three, and then you can get into the Cronenbergs and the Sarah Paulies and the, you know, Patricia Rosmas. But, one thing when you are approaching uh, anybody is just just to invest in knowing who everybody is and like you know when 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 I started knowing about Canadian film that's when I became part of the fabric of it and not that I can name ten Canadian directors I could probably name two hundred fifty right now and I probably had coffee with half of them that's the investment I think. Once you get into this, and, and probably same for editors, right? Kat, it's like, you know the editors that are out there. I know, and you're friends with them. And you and, get jobs from them because- and you get, and it, it helps. It, it, like you said, uh, Brandon, it all, it, it just rises everyone's um, ships as the tide comes in. And uh, the investment that we put into this, um, I, I, I would love this next wave to also have that curiosity. Because if we don't know our movies, if we actually don't see our films, it, I was at Wet Bum. I was there and I loved it. And I'm glad I was able to experience, experience it in the theatrical setting. You know, uh, Life Changer, uh, Hazy Little Thing. Uh, you know, these are important things that we need to do as a community and, and um, editors and post-production, it's, it's a big part of it too. You, you, you and it can be hard because we're locked away in our- You're in small little dark yeah, rooms. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
There's a, a really good point there, though, Warren, um, that uh, I think really needs to be covered for younger people coming in is that there's this um, this sort of pull right now to also be a critic while you're a filmmaker. And the biggest mistake I see a lot of young people make is they'll meet somebody who's further ahead in the game and that could help them and then insult them either to their face or behind their back or online or, you know, that was a shitty film, blah, 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 blah. Right. It, it, I'm not saying this is a personal experience thing, I'm sure, but I have run into it, but it's more just you, if you actually want to be an ally or collaborate or something like that, don't tear apart the thing you want to collaborate with because it doesn't help you in any way, shape or form. I, I believe we need a critical community and it's unfortunate oh, yeah. all the newspapers are shedding their cinema critics. I, I, we need them. We, just like you want someone to call you on your shit. Yep. I, I need that for the work that we do. Well, we need um, critics, but... Uh, but when I meet a filmmaker and all they have is complaints about the Canadian film industry, mm -hmm. it's like, what are you doing to change it then? <laughs> Help yeah, us. Be, exactly. Let's all work together. Be part of know? the solution, not part of the problem. Absolutely. Yeah. We've all yeah. made films and are like, I, I can attest, I made 167 music videos. <laughs> not all of them are good. <laughs> you know? well, I fully admit I've made crap in the past. Yeah, yeah. Not all of it, but we, some of it was crap. We can all be that. better. <laughs> Well, I really want to thank you for anyone, everybody watching. If you have more questions, if you leave notes on our Facebook page, we will try to answer them. And I really think, Warren, that's a great note to end on. Everyone here on this panel is generously given their time uh, today and is all, you can find out what everyone has made. Everyone has websites, IMDb, you can find out. So if you're interested in working with somebody on this panel, I, I, I am a big believer into your homework, the amount of emails I have received saying I love your work, right. and then it is pitching me the exact opposite of something I would ever produce is always a little bit of a, I'm so sorry I can't give you the time because you didn't even take the time to figure out if you like my work. You don't have to love all my movies, but everyone here has done such amazing work and uh, are easy to reach in different ways and thank you so much to the Canadian Film Festival for having me. It's my first time moderating. It's a little different than when I said yes and we were all going to be in person um, many, many moons ago but thank you very much for having us and thank you everyone for your generous information. I think I've made all the mistakes you've mentioned and I will try to not on the next one. <laughs> you know right I'm like why didn't we have this panel like years ago so that I could have not made all the mistakes that you guys just mentioned in my filmmaking adventures as well. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks guys. We, we could have kept going for another couple hours, but I'll let you all take a bathroom break now. <laughs> um, thank you for having us. For, yeah, it was awesome. Uh, for those who are watching, um, that's it for our industry series for, for CFF 2020 virtual edition. Um, please feel free to get in touch with us at any time. Like we do this for you guys, for the people who are out there who want to tell stories. Oh, he's coming. You guys like, so we're, good. we're in the same oh, house. No. You guys so oh, that was shocking. <laughs> 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 yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, we do this for you guys. We want to hear what you want to learn about. Please get in touch with us at any time. You can message us on the Facebook, uh, Canadian Film Fest Facebook socials. You can message me. You can message, message Warren, who's on our board of directors and also in my dining room right now. Um, and, uh, and please tune in tonight at 9 p.m. on Super Channel because we're playing Justin's film, Clapboard Jungle, which I'm so excited to see. And it's preceded by the short film Blue in Hollywood. So we got a great lineup and we got a whole day stacked tomorrow too. So we're not going away just yet. Um, Can we end on a shared aha moment? Yeah. Okay. Take on me. <laughs> yes. Take on me. Okay, I already done. <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> see you guys later. Bye. Dance out. <laughs> Hello, my name is Wendy Potomsky and I'm the managing partner and owner of Retake Furniture Rentals. Retake is once again a proud supporter of the Canadian Film Festival and is working to contribute to the Canadian film and TV industry by making it an easy and sustainable place to do business. Retake understands the importance of set design and the dynamic nature of the film and TV industry, which is why we created a company to specifically support Canadian filmmakers. Retake provides sustainable short and long-term furniture rental options to meet production schedules and product needs. Our in-house upholstery services can tailor our product to meet your set design requirements and match your color schemes. We use sustainable approaches to minimize product going to landfill when you no longer need the furniture on your set. Retake can also assist you in setting up your office with sustainable alternatives to keep your team working safely as we all head back to work during this unprecedented time. 
Our goal is to help you create memorable sets. Stay safe, everyone, and enjoy the films and shorts at this year's Canadian Film Festival.